Have you noticed how the categories left and right aren't that helpful in describing politics anymore? I mean, here we are in 2021, and we have the right railing against corporate monopolies. The, the real problem with Facebook is the monopoly power that they enjoy. No and the left cheering on censorship and calling for stronger domestic terrorism laws. We're flagging problematic posts for Facebook uh, that spread disinformation. No one would have anticipated that just five or ten years ago. And then looking beyond the United States, what would you even call a group like the Yellow Vests? Left? Right? They're both, and neither. Martin Gurry, the author of The Revolt of the Public, has a better conception for what shapes our politics today. He believes that the big dividing line is not between left and right, but between center and periphery. The center is the establishment in politics, culture, science, and everything else. This is the world of institutions, of credentialed experts, of authority. In the last century, when the mass media was dominated by just a handful of huge outlets, the center thrived. Back then, the media made its money through advertising. Since advertisers wanted to reach as many people as possible with their ads, there was a built-in incentive for each outlet to make its audience as big as possible. Alienating viewers and readers was bad for business, so the media tended to steer its content toward the broad political center. Its culture was conservative, in the non-political sense. It deferred to credentialed experts, respected authority, and stayed away from the political extremes on either side. But then along came the internet, which broke that business model. Google and Facebook provided advertisers with a superior advertising service, taking that market away from the mass media. The media industry found itself in a crisis, with no viable long-term revenue stream. In the meantime, the internet was allowing people to connect with each other directly, unconstrained by time and space. A vast, horizontal conversation began taking place, which was not controlled or guided by the mass media or other institutions of the center. This created problems for them. Suddenly, there was a way for the public to instantly respond to the statements of experts and the directives of authorities. At the same time, in its desperate search for a new business model, the media settled into what the writer Andrew Mirshnichenko calls donation by subscription. Outlets ask their audiences to pay for subscriptions as sort of a charitable service. Usually they do that by appealing to their audience's political preferences, by saying, we'll tell you the truth about the Trump administration, or we'll tell you what the liberal media doesn't want you to hear, or we'll combat disinformation. The incentives that the media used to have to grow their audiences by trying not to alienate anyone, were flipped. Now each media outlet has an interest in attracting a smaller but more loyal audience, one willing to pay money to see their own political values championed by the outlets they choose to subscribe to. Like professional sports, this is a business model that depends on rivalry and conflict. It caters to its most ardent fans. Instead of avoiding the extremes, the media now panders to them, affirming their prior beliefs and stoking anger toward the other side. Rather than a centripetal force that draws us toward the broad political center, the media has become a centrifugal force, pushing us away from each other and toward the margins. The digital social world we now inhabit is characterized by these two huge forces, the power of the internet to rapidly mobilize us into makeshift tribes and the fragmenting influence of the new mass media. The outcome is an unruly, networked public that spontaneously mobilizes in reaction to the center, just as quickly demobilizing again. This turbulent social space is what Guri calls the periphery. When we dispense with the idea of left versus right and start looking at the world as center versus periphery, recent events start making a lot more sense. Donald Trump's style of reactionary populism was never a perfect fit with a right-wing characterization, and his election was a rejection of the traditional Republican Party as much as it was of the Democrats. Driven by media polarization and online tribalism, Trump's victory was an expression of the outrage at the periphery over the center. Biden's election was a triumph of the center, but immediately upon entering office, his administration has been battered by the periphery. The Capitol riots of January 6th were a temper tantrum from the periphery at the center's reassertion of power. 
The mask and vaccine mandates have been as plain an expression of the center's authority as you could imagine, and the bitter outrage it has provoked is the defiance of the periphery. Those movements tend to be associated with the conservative side of the political ledger. But the periphery has expressed itself in a left-wing cast as well. Occupy Wall Street was a clear rebellion of the periphery against the center. So was the wave of protests against police violence last summer. Apart from aesthetics, these were not left-wing or right-wing eruptions. They were revolts against authority, against institutions, and against rule by expert technocrats. They were incubated on the internet and amplified by the media, which profits from social conflict. The most important thing to recognize is that these forces are not political, but structural. They won't be resolved through compromise, nor through one side prevailing over the other. There will always be new divisions and new battles, as long as the incentives of the digital media landscape are aligned as they currently are. This state of open conflict is not the exception. It's the rule. Until something drastic changes, this is simply our permanent reality.